recording. Um, and also just to say that um, please keep your mics off for now, if that's okay. And um, but feel free to turn them on later during the uh, discussion section. So we're delighted to be back um, with another webinar. Um, uh, today's session is called What Can YouTubers Teach Us About Creating Engaging Content, uh, led by uh, Liam McGoughlin from the University of London Birkbeck. Um, the session will cover um, how to learn from the approach YouTube content creators take uh, with the aim of improving how we engage our students. Um, we're due to finish in about an hour's time and there will be time for questions so please do um, put them in the chat box. I will kind of uh, feed them to Liam at the end um, but we can also turn our mics on if we want and uh, have, have, a, have a discussion. Um, as I said the session is recorded um, and please make sure you're muted for now. Um, we have quite a, a kind of packed presentation so I won't go on anymore but um, without further ado please welcome Liam. Hello so even before a significant shift towards online learning, a complaint made by many university educators was on the subject of student attention. With most classes being in the range of one to two hours, sometimes it can feel like learning is pointless as students look on with their glazed over eyes despite all your hard efforts. But now we've moved online and there are indicators that the issue attention has done nothing but get worsened. And this could be particularly blamed or partially at least on the quality of online learning which students have not rated highly. In one 2020 survey of 1,000 US students, 75% said they did not feel like they were getting quality e-learning experience from universities. In another survey in the same year with 3,400 undergraduates across from the US and Canada, this also returned low levels of student satisfaction with online teaching revision, at least anyway. 53% said they either disagreed or strongly disagreed that online learning was engaging in a classroom, while in another question, only 46% of the students stated that they were easily, easily able to stay motivated or engaged online. From the same survey, 75% of those said that the main issue was the lack of face-to-face -face interaction. Although it's not bad news, surely. In the same report, it was found that one of the single biggest determining factors was the perception that lecturers had made an effort. While in the UK, perceptions towards online learning are better, but not by much. And then the US 2020 survey found that 65% of students thought online teaching was a good standard, 16% disagreed. And But we should also be many, much concerned in many other ways as well. And we've also found that um, students from disadvantaged backgrounds are those who um, or least prepared for higher and those least prepared for higher education rather, are those that suffer the most when we move online. Now, I'm sure each and every one of you will have your own opinions on this, of course, but the general perception from students is that while they're really appreciative of the effort lecturers are putting in, the goodwill shown here does not necessarily translate to good online content. So why is it that engagement with and perceptions of online material are so low? Well, in part, it could be blamed that without the hold of being in the room uh, with a lecturer in, uh, with with their in, in lecture, sorry, students are more easily distracted. Maybe they don't have the learning environment required for long form educational materials, or maybe they just certainly miss that face to face interaction, which is useful in establishing trust and keeps both sides of the informational transaction engaged. And of course, provides a personal such, which is surely underrated. But we can show of one thing, the style of presentation within lecture theatres, while is a finely sculpted to a fine art offline, doesn't necessarily translate well online. So what is to be done? Well, over the last year and a bit, educators have sought new pedagogical techniques, such as utilizing the flipped classroom amongst many others. Many of us have sought to access information in the ways to do online learning and turn to our friends and colleagues at either our own institutions or within the excellent learn society, such as the PSA's own teaching and learning network. But one thing I will argue in this webinar, what we haven't done is looked outside the field of academia and towards quite possibly the biggest center of educational material that can be found online today, which is YouTube. According to Google's own survey, 86% of the site's viewers use YouTube to learn new things. And there are more learning related videos on YouTube than there are books in the US Library of Congress. And among them, they have more than 500 million views of learning related, uh, learning -related content every day in 2018. I suspect in 2021, that number is far higher. These content creators sit within the field of edutainment or educational entertainment, according to Chandler and Monday in 2011. These are where lessons from entertainment are used for strategic educational goals. 
The term has existed since the, you know, the ideas of school of play concepts in the Renaissance, but today we're talking about a very particular type of online content creation. YouTubers such as Tom Scott, who has more than 3.8 million subscribers, uh, other course um, channels such as Crash Course that has 12 million subscribers and 1.5 billion views, and even the School of Life channel, which teaches about the works of Marx, Locke, Plato, and more, have 6.7 million subscribers and three, 650 million views. Some of these are specifically targeting and assisting your students today, potentially this very second, with YouTubers such as Nurse Bass and Philosophy Tube creating content for current undergraduates. And these are just a small sample, they cover, and, but they cover a large range of subject areas, some more deeply than others, but they all share a common trait. They all operate within YouTube, which is metrified in dozens, if not hundreds of ways, not just view account, but they also analyze for repeat watches and importantly, key engagement metrics. And these metrics ultimately matter. They dictate how wide these channels are shared and ultimately engagement is measured in such a way that success depends on the presenter's ability to engage and hook audiences onto content. And these audiences on YouTube are returning time and time again to these channels, not because they feel like they're going to get a shiny degree at the end or because they will need it to write their next essay, but because they perceive value in this content. And as it turns out, being engaged often leads you to wanting more. So it's no study that in a, uh, no wonder that in a study by Pearson of those aged 14 to 24, 60% said they preferred learning about new subjects from YouTube than a book. And while overall statistics for overall leadership are somewhat and surprisingly elusive for an online platform, it, we can look into, we found that YouTube reaches about 80.9% of smartphone users in the UK, according to Comscore in 2020. So it's probably safe to argue that if you like it or not, the online, your online video content is uh, the subject for today's webinar is being compared to edutainers in terms of overall quality of the video and ability to engage. So this all begs the question, what are they doing right? And what appropriate techniques can we take from these highly optimized content creators and deploy with their own learning environments? So what you've just experienced is a, what I like to call, or what is called in the term, a cold open, and hopefully one of the many techniques I hope to share with you today. A cold open is one of the oldest but simplest techniques of throwing the audience quickly into a narrative before they have the chance to get distracted, and you present to them with questions and issues to which the inquisitive amongst the audience will want to stick around to see the answer for. So as I mentioned at the beginning, my name's Dr. Liam Glockin, and hopefully now I've captured your attention, I want to spend the next 25 minutes or so highlighting some of the most common techniques developed by educational YouTubers to capture their audiences. I'll be focusing on those I've used in my own teaching at some point or another, alongside some of the evidence-based approaches for explaining their effectiveness. It should be noted that I'm predominantly going to be talking about pre-recorded uh, content, so it's useful to keep that in mind. I've also been quite selective about what YouTubers I'm taking lessons from. I've not sought to take lessons from channels with tens of camera crews, hundreds of editors, and lots of researchers, but instead focused on what we can learn by entertainment YouTubers who operate predominantly independently or with very small teams, and thus something we as independent lecturers can aspire to recreate. Ultimately, what I'm going to be going through, many of you will not have the time or institutional resources to undertake, but at minimum, you might be able to incorporate some of these going on to the future, and even some of the easier and smaller changes presented here today can probably make a significant difference to how your content is perceived. So, for example, before we go back, when we go back to in-person teaching, you still might want to create short pre-lecture videos because the evidence suggests students who watch these before engaging with the reading or the main lectures ultimately perform better. And while what I might be saying might seem like a bit like going back to basics when it comes to online content creation, hopefully I'll provide just a tiny bit of under extra understanding of why these approaches work and why they're important. So to do so, I'm going to be splitting this talk into four key areas. So firstly, I want to quickly talk about equipment and why you should basically upgrade from your laptop or basic webcams and, to, and microphones as well to something that will result in better quality videos. Then I want to go into the presentation style and what techniques YouTubers use to get, get and keep your attention. And then I'll go into scripting and workflow. So how does the video creation processes work in the production line? And finally, the negatives of the approaches. After all, if I put the negatives at the beginning of the, of the webinar, you might think the rest of the talk is going to be pointless and just switch off. But not everything is great about this approach and there are a few things you'll probably want to be considering. So let us begin. So 
There's a simple fact when it comes to the experiences of viewers on online content is that the first thing they will notice about the video is quality, both the image and the audio. Either it will meet a student's expectations, in which instance no further thoughts will be put into it, which would be, could be quite frustrating if you put lots of effort into it, or the video quality will be below expectations and result in dissatisfaction in the video and at worst distraction from them. So while you might be having some absolutely excellent things to be, say, to be said, the interpreted quality of this content will be defined by the poor quality presentation on behalf of the hardware and how this hardware is deployed. Unsurprisingly, this is something that which has been well documented across multiple academic papers, including studies by Dobrain and et al. 2013, who found that poor viewing experiences correlated with viewers clicking away from online videos, even if they really wanted to watch the subject matter to begin with. And there's also nothing worse for audiences than having to sit through a 40 minutes of video when the quality of the audio takes up important mental resources. And as a result, it'd be quite exhausting to understand the content. After all, audio translation takes up important mental resources I mentioned, and it's the same reason why you might instinctively go to turn off the radio when you're driving down the highway and you're about to hit a roundabout and you want to concentrate on reading. So one thing to take away is that audio, and especially bad audio, takes up even more resources than that. So a key message here is that poor audio quality is incentivizing students to listen to someone better. Likewise, if I'm being shown a video and the quality of the camera is comparable to that of a potato, I might be tempted to look away from my screen and do something, something else. Even worse, I might start picking up my phone and start multicasting and looking at my phone and scrolling through social media, or even worse, speeding up the video, which comes with heavy impact when it comes to students' ability to recall information. And while most USB webcams and those within laptops are fine for video calls, because talking to someone in a live environment is just that bit more captivating, um, they'll often fall short when you're seeking to create video uh, content online, which is why I'm probably going to apologize for those of you who are watching this as a YouTube recording, because due to a variety and large amount of techno-sociological reasons, you're probably less engaged than those, if, uh, those people who are here with us watching live in the Zoom meeting. And indeed, going back to YouTube, YouTube have made the quality of the image and the audio as part of their algorithm to what they recommend, because at the end of the day, poor quality video correlates with poor engagement. So the first lesson we can take from YouTubers here is that while the content matters, the quality of how this content is displayed is an important factor for interpretation. So where do I begin? Well, I'd argue predominantly students are looking forward to that personal connection often online, and that means they're trying to look at your face. So Obviously, that means having a good web camera set up and having to be able to present my voice well. So how do I do this? Well, as I mentioned before, the webcam provided by most laptops are fairly decent for video calls and live sessions, but really they start to show their limitations when you're creating online content. They look grainy and the tiny sensors within them for a variety of reasons, which I won't get into now, often lead to reduction in quality. So even while your kind of webcam might say it's 4K, because the sensor is so small, it's still not going to be that great compared to other methods of capturing video. So what are your options? Well, many of you, your phones, like this one, has a really decent camera inside it. And you know, cameras are often a killer feature when in flagship phones, so something many phone manufacturers are trying to get right. Indeed, many reporters, for those such as working for the BBC, will often use their mobiles for short segments. The alternative option, and the one I use, is a DSLR mirrorless camera, so something like this. And these allow you to take out lenses, if you so wish, like this, and swap them around and be a bit more creative, if you so wish. They also allow you to plug in external microphones and, as I said, swap uh, lenses to match the scene you're filming better. And generally, they create much better, higher quality video. Occasionally, if I'm feeling a bit creative, I might try and use both my mobile phone camera and um, my, my uh, actual DSLR to create multiple angles and shots to keep particularly long scenes fresh. For a DSLR, you can be looking from anything from £300, what's called a vlogger pit, and this includes you know, most things you'll need, such as a tripod and things like that, to up to £600 for something with a bit more advanced features. Now, microphone. As I mentioned before, in many instances, audio is far more important than video. So get yourself a decent external microphone. You can get them for your webcam if needed, uh, for your uh, mobile phone if needed. And in recent regard, you've got some really good options. You can get yourself a lavalier uh, microphone like you're seeing uh, in studios, or you can get yourself something called a shotgun microphone like this one, which is really good for capturing your audio from a bit of a distance. Or if you're feeling particularly like you've already got something, you know, if you've done 
um, interviews as part of your research, you might have one of these lying around. These have fairly good audio quality, as you hopefully would have noticed and bought one for. You can utilize these if it's got an op option to send uh, your audio externally to your camera. Um, and what I also use is I also have a USB microphone as well because, um, and a good quality one, because again, if I'm doing voiceover work, so for example, if I've got a, a few scenes where I'm not on camera, like I'm showing, I'm talking over a video or something else like that, I'll, it's good to have um, that option as well. Now, as I mentioned, there's plenty of options, but try to avoid buying something cheap or cheap headsets or cheap lav, uh, lav mics, and because they ultimately sound absolutely trash um, and it's just not worth your money. In terms of other things you might need and um, something I use, firstly, tripods. Bad camera placement is something which is something certainly to avoid. So often when you're trying to create videos where you're looking into the camera, um, you want something which is at eye level. Um, anything below, above or below can be distracting and at worst and flattering. So you might want to also have a separate lighting for your tri uh, separate tripod for your lighting, which I will quickly talk about below. So in video photography and the same in videography, the difference between a good quality photo or video is often lighting. Most cameras require a good amount of light to work properly and to avoid increasing the ISO, which as I mentioned before, might increase, uh, create a grainier image, a good lighting setup can get the best out of your camera. Many creators use a two point system. One involves having one piece of lighting, um, the main key light, for example, which is what I've got on my right side side here in front of my webcam, which you can't see. Um, and it'll also have a kind of a background light on the other side. Um, and this just stops any sort of, it keeps my face well illuminated, but also stops shadows. Um, and it's something to be considered. And also don't forget one of the brightest lights in existence, which is the sun, uh, which is annoyingly washing out my screen in the back, back if you can't see through the window. So you can also record outside or you can use natural daylight through a window if possible. And some creators even choose to shoot at certain times of the day because they prefer using natural light. Plus it's a lot easier and cheaper. So as I mentioned, good light encompasses much more than um, whether your students see you, you as a subject or not. Lighting can also really be impactful in creating a good amount of mood or emotive connection. So ask yourself, how do you want your students to feel? Different kind of lights with varying styles and intensity can give different tonal cues. So think about how your lighting conveys the mood you're seeking to match with your message that you're giving any particular lecture. And also, where do you want your viewers to look? You know, uh, contrasting lighting can naturally uh, draw your viewers' eyes. Uh, for example, um, high contrast on my face makes me stand out compared to my background. And when you're fighting the battle of keeping your students' attention, everything matters. Um, and again, in terms of kind of lighting options, you know, you can go on Amazon and buy yourself a cheap kind of twenty-pound uh, lighting setup with batteries, and it works just fine. And um, now, I want to quickly talk about my teleprompter setup. Now we're going to talk a bit more about the importance of scripting later, but there's a, probably a very good reason why you should potentially consider um, a teleprompter and why they're used fairly universally across YouTube and, um, and other kind of video uh, setups. Ultimately, scripting and the use of teleprompter cuts down on the use of errors, so the, all the ums and ahs that you might say, which can be quite distracting when you're doing a video, and really does help the reader look into the camera um, without looking like you're reading notes. Uh, which can, can help create a more parasocial relationship and helps the watcher engage themselves with what you have to say. And finally, it helps you actually focus on presenting. You're not trying to recall information. The words are in front of you already. You've written them down. I'm sure you, whatever script you write will be excellent. Um, and it just helps with the focusing on you, getting the tone right and the cadences. And just if you don't know, um, a teleprompter, by the way, is just like a one-way uh, mirror which bounces your script up at you while your camera hides behind it. So uh, for those of you who don't like looking at cameras, which are quite a lot of us, actually, most people you know, to look directly into the camera is a scary thing. And um, that can help with that as well. I got mine fairly cheap on Amazon, um, which uses my iPad. So I load my uh, script onto my iPad using a free online teleprompter software called I think it's teleprompter.mirror.com, um, which very cleverly has an audio detection system as well. So the script moves as, you as you're talking, so you don't have to worry about trying to flick through your script as you're talking at the same time. Um, and also my teleprompter has lots of shoe mounts, so I can connect my lighting and my microphone to it and it also holds the camera. So it makes life a lot easier. And finally, last probably bit of equipment you want to be considering is set dressing. Now, not everyone has the ability to create a full studio, but with a bit of LED lighting, as you can see on screen, um, 
and a bit of a cardboard cutout of the event, I'm able to make the best of what I've got. And it just helps make your background a bit more relevant or aesthetically pleasing to the eye. And you also have to consider that, you know, you're being judged again by professional YouTubers who have great sets and just being able to look like you put that extra additional information uh, effort in, students do notice this. And obviously you've got to consider that your background is actually a way to help students find uh, find ways to create reasons to remember your content or what you've got to say about any in any particular lecture. So you can move the background a bit in between lectures to keep it fresh. And finally, the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to equipment is you've got to learn to use all the above. You know, it's not enough to have all this great equipment. It's important to know how to use it. For instance, you might notice my cameras when I'm uh, doing videos that I use focusing and different apertures to blow the background a bit. And I've taught myself about light placement and how to record good audio. And the best place to learn about all of this is actually YouTube. You know, there's hundreds of people out there who create content, how to set yourself up a little micro studio like I've got. Um, so potentially you want to look out for guides which talk about camera placement, um, uh, again, lighting, which I mentioned previously, how to illuminate your face, how to avoid washing out the camera, um, and how to use background lighting, and again, importantly, how to improve the quality of your audio. So how should I wrap up this section on equipment? Well, I just want to end the message that I've purposely not given any explicit recommendations on what equipment you should be buying, because firstly, not everyone has the finances to go all into this. And I don't want to give you the impression that, you know, there's a set entry point for any of this. Um, there isn't. It's up to kind of what you already own um, or potentially make uh, best use of what you've already got. And secondly, just to recognize that technology changes pretty quickly. And also a lot of this equipment you might want to use outside of teaching as well. So look into reviews and see what kind of features you want. Again, I do photography as a hobby, so I have a fairly decent camera already. And maybe I just had to buy a brand new lens to do photography uh, videos with it. So, just let me scroll down here to my next thing. Right, so here's the second chapter which I want to talk about. So now we talked about some of the equipment needs to create this YouTuber style. So what about the presentation techniques they utilize? Well, what I've got on screen is a range of educational YouTubers of some of whom I looked into when researching on how to create great online content rather than the guides available from academia at the beginning of lockdown at that time. There's a few differences from my approach to theirs. For starters, their sets probably definitely and surely definitely put mine to shame and often taken specialist locations or they have some fantastic props. Although it probably might be said, um, I will definitely argue that the Sutton Hoo helmet is way more interesting than the cheap microwave which Tom Scott has up in the top right corner. They might also be able to, see, these YouTubers might also be seeking to engage with a more general audience um, and so they'll speak with little expectation of prior engagement with the subject. And finally, they will have um, they will clearly be having different strategic objectives. Um, but aside from their overall approach to engaging uh, their audience, is you know a lot of their approaches, sorry, that to engage with their audience is something we can adapt and utilize for our content. So, what makes these YouTubers' styles distinct and engaging? Well, from sitting through and watching them, you might see a number of commonalities. They're all speaking directly to the camera um, as audience, as if they're a friend. Um, they'll utilize segue and satire to keep their topics fresh, and they'll motivate their audiences through call to actions and utilize a range of engagement techniques, such as seeking to occasionally shift the uh, position of the camera or display on screen graphics of relevant clips to keep the visual fresh. And also you'll notice, and we'll talk a bit this about later, none of them use PowerPoint, <laughs> uh, which I think is something which is uh, actually quite interesting and something we should potentially open up to debate. So what are the key lessons we can adopt? Well, firstly, again, I mentioned this previously, being present is important. In YouTube videos, being able to see the presenter's face allows for the creation of both a personal bond between the presenter and the viewer. And in a lecture theatre, this happens naturally because you're obviously present, but this isn't necessarily a given online. And indeed, the recording feature in PowerPoint, you know, is completely woeful this because it, features, it prioritizes the screens, uh, the slides, sorry, um, while I've seen some lectures which have no recording of the face at all. Yet researching why people watch YouTube and even Twitch streams um, is because they feel that a personal connection and through is important, especially through those of building a parasocial relationships. And this starts with being able to see the presenter's face, as I mentioned before, which is why I would argue uh, it would lead to better engagement, especially in environments where personal contact has been limited. And in a paper by the Journal of Educational Psychology, you know, this backs this up too. 
Um, in Cassell's et al's 2015 paper, they found that lecture videos that show the instructor's face are far more effective than simple narrated slideshows. Likewise, papers by Strodel et al in 2006 and Scorsese Worrell et al in 2015 found that students really do miss face-to-face -face interaction when learning has moved online, which is also a suggestive that actually your face does matter, so don't underrate your face when it comes to learning. Likewise, other tactics YouTubers utilize here is speaking directly to the audience. Some YouTubers, they have collective names for their audiences, and it all boils down to developing emotional energy into your video by helping students feel connected to the contents of the video and to a lesser extent yourself as their lecturer. Simple tactics I've used is mentioning questions or statements raised by students in previous live sessions and language that indicates that I'm speaking to them, not just a camera. And while this won't be a direct replacement for building the bonds in person as uh, that teaching would have, I found students really appreciate that I've created content that at least speaks um, and attempts to authentically speak directly to them. So again, I make sure I'm not rhetorically speaking to the camera, but instead I'm talking to the students. And I'm also aware of anecdotal feedback I've heard from students, which is includes they really don't like the idea. In fact, they actively hate the idea that lecturers are reusing videos. So I'll add in a few dates here and there and let the student know that this is something I've recorded just for them. It isn't just a dusty vault uh, video I've retrieved from the vault. Another very important uh, factor in engaging in an engagement strategy is making educational materials just that bit more fun through the incorporation of entertainment techniques. Now, for some time, the work by Steffers and Deviga in 2000, uh, since 2012, it's been known that for digital natives, of that being millennials and onwards, Humor in videos that are congruent to the subject matter um, more effectively reinforces the material and significantly increases the retention of learning outcomes, both in short and long terms. And this is deployed on YouTube quite often. So take, for example, a YouTuber, Caitlin Doherty. Um, she seeks to provide educational content on the fairly inanimate object of dead uh, death education, which one might argue is a pretty tough crowd. But because she uses hints of comedy to make hate maintain her advocacy goals of educating the general public about what happens in the funeral industry and beyond, she successfully teaches um, on the subject by creating narratives through the discussions of iconic corpses, um, through the discussion of unusual events for in the deaths of D.H. Lawrence, Derry Beatham, and also Lenin. So again, she incorporates jokes of here and there. Now, there are multiple ways you can engage your audiences with satire when it comes to teaching about politics. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean turning the concept of Marx into hour long comedy sketches, but a few jokes here and there or something that helps explain the concept raised in his text can help students remember the contents of the lecture. So take, for instance, one of my favorite academics approaches to this, which is that of Dr. Stephen Pickering from Brunel University, who uses on multiple occasions a puppet of Karl Marx to explain international relations theory alongside the way he cracks a few jokes uh, through the use of what he calls comedy Karl including the joke of how many capitalists does it take to change a light bulb? None, they own the means of production, so they get their wage slaves to do it for them. Dr. Pickering also talks directly to the audience to build that parasocial rapport, which I spoke about how YouTubers use, and he even does some of his lectures outside for a bit of an interesting scenery change. I really do recommend having a look at some of those videos. He's been kind enough to put, upload them to uh, YouTube, and I think he's actually won a, an award by from the university for how good he's been doing in terms of online content provision. And they're also just a fantastic example of how you can input a bit of creativity into engaging your audience. Likewise, taking influence from the SNES game Street Fighter 2, he uses a bit of a screen cap with a bit of photo editing to explain differences between Locke and Hobbes. So if you've got some video editing skills, I implore you to go wild. In my own videos, I've had a bit of fun creating scenes where it appears that I'm talking to myself, debating two sides of contemporary debates and so on. It takes a time, bit of time to set up, that's for granted, but I found that even if it comes across as incredibly cheesy, students love it. The appearance that you put the effort in and the, and is really important to students. And again, this appearance is just the appearance of putting in effort is often enough to create the emotional connections to remember the content going on forward. There are also some other tricks you can utilize too. The creation of narratives, as I mentioned with the work of Kate and Doherty, as I briefly mentioned, to build your learning content into a story from which students will want to stay in, in, engaged with. There's also the pre-mentioned cold open, which I did to you all at the beginning, and, and, making, um, and making content relevant through the occasional reference to popular TV, of course, keeping your student demographic in mind, or making reference to your students' your locality, or current events to remind the students that, there be, that their learning can be applied outside of the classroom or the online video into their very real worlds. 
But this approach isn't even that new. In a guide by Burke back in 2007, they go on to say that the instructor can take up the title of educator by entertaining students while providing an education and meeting the course objectives that involves the use of a lot of variety. So you can do things such as like little skits, bits of impromptu satire. You can add in demonstrations with the scenarios. You can throw in some jazz slides or more appropriately in this instance, throwing in video sequences, adding in a bit of flair and some work related examples and just making that um, lecture and your video online content just a bit more engaging to all the students. Bird goes on to say that humour has a really important role in lecture theatre, or in this instance, the video, and can really actually help ease a lot of anxieties a lot of students have and allowing them to relax, which should allow students to learn more effectively and efficiently. And there are suggestions this approach will work very well in education. So in a paper by Stefan de Viga, again, which I mentioned before in 2012, of university, uh, they did a study of university students and they found that employing comedy within module teaching improved their retention of information and ultimately improved students' assessment scores by a grade and a half, which when applied to the UK system can move a grade of 65 up to a 70. So it's fairly significant. And of course, all of this has to be within reason. And I say again, not everything has to be a comedy sketch, but a few diversions to give students a bit of time to organize their thoughts in the middle of a video surely helps. Another technique I want to highlight is that of the CTA, or what's also known as a call to action. Now, calls to actions are famous within marketing for one core reason. As it turns out, telling someone to do something often works. And with YouTube videos, they're no different. Often you'll find uh, edutainment videos asking viewers to undertake tasks to help boost engagement stats, such as adding a comment or liking the video, or even asking to purchase merchandise in support of the channel. Likewise, this is a simple tool for getting students to undertake actions which can help with their reading and you can be used tactically can be extremely effective, such as asking students directly in videos um, to comment within dis discussion boards or to come to a live session having done the reading. Oddly enough, I found that this actually increases the number of students who do the reading and is far more effective than ranting at students during a live session when they don't have the opportunity to go back and undertake the pre-session activities anyway. And because you're in a student's home, you're in a position to ask um, directly access um, ask to directly access the reading there and then. So, and I've also found that CTAs work best when you frame the question around a narrative that which mentally places the student in an environment where they're already imagining themselves underneath that undertaking the task. So rather than I want you to so asking a question such as I want you to do the reading for Gibson Award and internet campaigning, instead say something on the lines I would instead ask students to go, you know, after you've watched this video, give the link to, uh, give the link to the reading a click and look out for the way in which the authors describe the nature of social media campaigns and then maybe asking them a few additional questions. So asking them if they think it resonates with their own experience of online campaigning, making it personal once again, and also maybe reminding students that we'll be asking these um, asking them to reiterate these responses in the live session. So make sure to write down their thoughts beforehand. Again, the, the ask isn't necessarily making them do the reading. It's creating an expectation that reading is, again, the expectation, but the ask is asking the students to consider a very specific part of that. And finally, if you can keep lectures fairly short and split them up if you can. It'd be no surprise that if you go onto YouTube, you'll find most content is around 10 to, uh, 10 to 20 minutes. And as it turns out, according to the University of British Columbia's design principles for multimedia, media, this is the max amount of time you have as a presenter before your viewers start getting into cognitive overload. And from what we know about students at home's learning patterns, they tend to work in chunks of just under an hour or so, which is about the length of time they'll have before getting distracted by children, spouse or even mealtime, or if they have to go off and have to stretch their legs or uh, also, which, by the way, you should be encouraging your students to do that. You should be as a um, short exercises actually does keep the mind very fresh. And if you're looking at your screen for more than 50 minutes at a time, um, my optometrist has told me that's actually very bad for you. Um, so actually, if you're uh, listening to this video now, please do take this opportunity to look away from your screen and something in the far distance for more, uh, more than 20 feet away for a few seconds, as this will do your eyes wonders, I've heard. Students also learn better if you can split up tasks into manageable short chunks. And how I do this, when appropriate, is splitting my lectures into 15-minute segments as short video resources. I would each segment starting by asking questions, often innovative, that starts the brain ticking early on, whose only answer for the student can be for an understanding of the theory, which you're going to tell them in the video. For instance, on a lecture of the media effects, I've started a lecture by pondering to what degree my daily media intake can influence me, and ask the students to consider the same for themselves. 
In another example, I started a digital campaigning lecture by questioning what I needed to beat my political opponents if I was running a political campaign. Before long, we moved on to the ideas of different ways, uh, waves of digital campaigning and the bones of campaigning on the internet are ready for me to flesh out with theory. Another approach is flipping the uh, lecture on the micro scale, providing 10 minutes videos for students to watch before undertaking their next piece of reading, before watching yet another video. Framing and asking students to look for specific um, answers to specific relevant questions you've raised in the videos or talk about the theories you've raised in that 10 minutes and how they um, and ask them to apply that to the reading. So again, you're making students flip between the two things in very short succession and keeps their mind fresh. And we also have to consider how students are more often than not these days seeking to cram in the information as much short a period of time as possible. I know students day, these days, it's not uncommon to hear that they watch videos in 1.5 or even two times speed to get it over and done with. And this doesn't necessarily correlate well with memory recall. So by splitting up your videos, you're disincentivizing this behavior, um, which is something we obviously want to be seeking to do. Now, uh, oddly enough, uh, with an eye on the time, I'll probably skip over this um, particular slide, but in summary, it's an application of Marx and May, uh, Clarks and Mayer's five principles of cognitive psychology when applied to creating online resources. Um, and what they really do, what I wanted to really highlight in this screen is that they highlight the use of graphics where appropriate on screen and how best to avoid sensory overload during videos. So what they recommend is don't avoid speaking over text, for example, uh, which is actually something I'm doing here, so I do apologize for that. But it's also, an, again, another reason why not to have large PowerPoint slides with lots of text. You're asking students to read something on one side and listen to you at the same time. Um, that's just going to take up more mental resources when you want them to focus on what you're saying. Obviously, other things they recommend is how you should seek to provide an explanation for visual materials or news, such as graphs or tables. And once again, they talk about the personalization and using a conversational tone, uh, which actually really does help with learning because it starts uh, bringing up uh, the right of recall, uh, sorry, the ability to recall via social cues. In short, these are all things we find YouTube entertainers on YouTube um, channels and what they're doing. They sparsely use text, and if they do, it's often to quote from someone from which they're concurrently reading out loud, or if they're applying them to an active example to help their audience visualize what they're saying. Take, for instance, this slide from Tom Scott once again. He rarely uses screen on text, uh, sorry, text on screen, sorry. Instead, he conveys his message through the use of scenes or being on location. Again, you'll very rarely see a YouTuber use PowerPoint slides because they're absolutely terrible at keeping your audience engaged and will uh, use on screen, and YouTubers will use on screen graphics rarely and tactically to really drive a point home. Which again, as I mentioned before, there should probably be a stronger debate over the effectiveness of, of PowerPoint in online learning, but um, that's for another time. Now back to our friend, uh, Dr. Steve Pickering. Once again, he's not using um, PowerPoint, but instead he's applying graphics at the editing stage with the appropriate, um, appropriate time to highlight appropriate images, graphics, tables, or to use uh, highlighting specific quotes worthy of note. So how in actuality does this approach look in the real world? Well, for a start, you're going to have to plan, um, and I want to talk here about my workflow at least, so yours will be different um, and mileage will vary. But what I found is that you're going to have to, at the beginning of all of your process of creating a brand new online video, is really start thinking about how you envisage formatting it. Are you going to create a mini series of videos or are you going to create slightly longer ones? And you really need to think about your learning goals and any particular subject and make the judgment call on what you think will suit best um, for both the subject and also your students. When you've done that, I found you've got a bit of front loading to do. This takes in the form of writing yourself up a script of exactly what you're going to say in verbatim. This probably incorporates a lot of this kind of stage is also where you'd start doing the work, what you'd do when you're drawing up a lecture. But you need to give yourself an extra hour or two hours to write up that verbatim script of what you're going to say. And at this point, um, have some thought about what you'd like to have on screen at any point of time, so for example, text and graphics or so on. And also, it's probably worthwhile at this note at this point to remember accessibility. You don't want to be putting screen um, images on screen, which is pertinent to your subject area without explaining them. Or if it's just an image with, uh, if you're going to be sharing images, um, if it's just decoration, that's, that's probably a bit of a less of concern. But of course, always refer to your university's policies on creating accessible content. Then I normally set up my mini studio and load my script into the teleprompter and get the camera and lighting set up. 
Importantly, what I was always recommend here is do a sound video check. There have been so many times where I've recorded like a 20 minute segment and I found out like there's something wrong with the audio. Maybe I didn't pipe, uh, plug in the microphone or something. Um, and it's, there's nothing worse than recording that 20 minute segment of having to find out it's unusable and then go back once again after thinking you've done a great performance. One of the benefits from this is that um, during this process, you can stop and start as you feel free to. So if you feel like you've made a mistake, you can simply stop the recording and start from back off where you um, made the error. And you can usually what you find is that editing can actually save you time here. You know, you can cut out sections and you when we think about creating video content, don't think about it too linearly. You don't have to do a 20 minute video in one go. You can split it up if you feel like it. And if you're very clever with the use of changing scenes and things like that, students won't even notice that there's a gap in between uh, your different recordings. What I also found out is make sure your backdrop doesn't change if you're going to be doing this technique because I've had a, um, my LED lights were on a, like a cycle rotation of going through different colors and it, because the colors were different in the background, it was so obvious that I've done that. So that's one thing to look out for. And then the next stage is transfer your video clips to whatever video editing software you use. So I've got access to Adobe Creative Cloud. Many universities will have access to this, so please do use this. Um, so I use Premiere Pro, but there's alternatives such as Final Cut Pro, uh, Cut Pro or DaVinci Resolve, which is free. And this is where I think the fun really begins. You know, you can cut out mistakes, you can apply on screen graphics, you can add in transitions. And, you, and if you've been a bit creative with multiple cameras or locations, you know, you can start um, editing these in here. You can also at this stage apply audio fixing such as removing background noise again it's really important to process your audio um, again i'm not going to go into exactly how to do this and there's plenty of youtube videos for how to do that um, but expect the editing process to take as long as your video when you've done all this you need to export it to whatever video file your university uh, streaming service uses and if available remember to apply auto captioning um, i know there's options available with panopto and youtube um, and also, if you can do add in time points uh, to your videos, this really helps students who have to jump in, out or in and out of the video to uh, stay on focus. Realistically, this is a process you will probably get faster at, but you need to plan ahead and it will take additional time. I found for a 30 minute video, um, I can probably get it scripted, provided I've already got a lecture to work off in probably about 45 to 50 minutes, recorded in 40 and edited in 50 minutes. So just over two hours time. So you will need to do, uh, think about times when you do this. Which leads me on to what's not so great about this approach. So very quickly, what are the negatives? Well, the first should be obvious, time and resources. When you consider the amount of time it takes to create a lecture and then add on top what is required to add these assets together, it quickly adds up over the course of a module. And many lecturers don't have the time to be putting these materials together. And even then, when you consider the highly optimized workflows of YouTubers, creating video content equals time. So that's one thing you have to remember. Likewise, there's also time and investment in to learn how to use an appropriate software and how to take good videos. And that's something we have to, um, there's the additional burden too. But then we move back in, um, but then again, when we move back into in-person learning, at, um, as what the majority of universities are planning to do soon, we're seemingly at a crossroads where some modules will apparently still remain online or universities will offer online and offline courses. In these instances, you'll probably find that students, rightfully, will be expecting higher video quality content. Furthermore, the way I see it, most people would be employing these techniques, myself included, not as a replacement, but to supplement offline teaching. So just because um, just because when you look at the performance of students who engage in the flipped classroom techniques and utilize online content as well as offline, the advantages of recap videos and things like that are really um, hard to consider scrapping. Um, so it's something we should potentially be willing to learn. Linked to this is resources. Some equipment is expensive and not everyone's employer will be willing to cost. But then again, this is a negative of the approach or is it a wider question about the resources given to lecturers? Anyway, that's in the, probably a debate for another time. We also have to consider the expectation this style of edutainment gives the student. It once again burdens the lecturer with additional responsibilities. In instance, you're asking uh, lecturers not only just to educate, but also to entertain as well. And which is an area I'm personally extremely aware of, and I will seek to keep some of the entertainment aspects you'll find on YouTube channels in the download. Then, and we link to this, others might have a more philosophical standpoint against um, making educational um, materials more entertaining. The classic example were those who turned to Neil Postman in their 1985 book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, an argument within the format that education needs to be carefully considered. After all, education requires a 
some time of active engagement rather than the passive involvement most people have when watching YouTube videos. And finally, access. Not all YouTube video is accessible. As I mentioned previously, many students who really do enjoy face-to-face -face teaching and moves to offline, off online content uh, do risk disadvantaged students from different backgrounds. So where's next? Well, as the image suggests, this is an approach that, take this approach not as a race, but seek to incorporate these lessons in bite-sized pieces. You don't have to jump straight into it, but instead apply what you think is relevant when you think it is pedagogically appropriate. Um, now, I wish I could show you some direct results, but what I'm working off here is the feedback I've had from my students who have applied these lessons. Now, through feedback in the modules where I've taught using these techniques, students have ultimately singled out my online teaching as material as good, enjoyable and memorable. In student module feedback, overall satisfaction with module has been higher than school and department averages. Likewise, the same was for students when students were asked about the module being stimulating or questions about overall learning materials and the participation, online provision, and of course, questions of if the lecturer found ways to teach online that work for this course. Again, I found myself being rated highly, higher than both the school and department averages. And finally, the stat I'm most proud of um, was from my last module evaluation, which is a question of if taking the module online was enjoyable. And I found that the result was 20% higher than the school mean, which suggests to me ultimately that my approaches work here. So as a final point, before we move on to the questions, I want to remind you all that YouTube is your friend. I learned all my skills in relation to this video creation from there. So after you finish watching this webinar, maybe I suggest you take a look. So thank you very much for all your time. And I very much look forward to all your questions. Um, and finally, before I hand over to Q&A, I do want to remind everyone that the ECN conference is happening next week. So if you want to register for that, please feel free. Um, and also looking for a few more discussants for a number of panels. So if you're interested in getting involved with the conference, please do email me after this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, Liam. That was uh, really uh, interesting. I'm very conscious now of my of my lighting and by <laughs> my very boring background i did a webinar in the spring in the evening and as time went on and it got darker and darker all you could see was my glasses by the end so um, i have learned slightly but my uh, but my lighting's still not brilliant um so we have quite a few questions and i'll just start actually um uh with one about kind of um kind of budgets and kind of finances really quite a few questions yeah. about that and you touched on it as well in your in your kind of um second to last slide um i guess and again it's, it's bigger than a, a bigger than your presentation but a bigger than you can answer but i think it's, yeah. I think it's a useful uh, a discussion point really it's kind of what our responsibility is um uh, versus our kind of employer in terms of you know kind of paying for equipment training etc um quite a, a few questions along a similar line really um Stuart's asked um you know has anyone had any joy getting their employer to pay for decent equipment etc so i guess there is this question about kind of how much we take on personally mm -hmm. um and how much um, our institution takes on and what can we do to kind of encourage our employer to take a kind of a strategic approach for kind of all lecturers rather than us kind of you know doing it piecemeal yeah so i think it's a partly a personal question as well so many people might be willing to take on the expense themselves because they'll see the advantages of owning a lot of this equipment right um not everyone should have to do that though so in my previous institution i did actually ask and get access to um video equipment from their media department and they're actually quite willing um, once you ask the question, you also, you know, you've got to really make the argument that we're doing online content. It's got to be done right. We don't want it to look bad. And, you know, ultimately, this is affecting important feedback scores from students. So there's a strong argument here that universities should be facilitating and helping you get this equipment or at least loaning it out to um, their employees. Um, so, yeah, I think that's what, in short, kind of what I have to think. I mean, this is, a, as you said, is it a bigger argument? Um, and it's not what, and it's one I've been luckily enough not to think, have to think too much of, either because I've got my own equipment or university have been uh, very willing to lend it out. Um, but obviously, there's different institutions have will have different responses to that question. Kind of a link to that, I wonder if one kind of potential pressure point is 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 is, is the students. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, if student expectations are that you know we have you know, a certain you know a certain style of presentation or kind of professionalism in our presentation and they feed that back um mm. that kind of you know end of end of module um feedback or as part <coughs> of other kind of surveys etc that's one potential pressure point i suspect mm. 
universities might respond more to student feedback than the staff yeah. feedback, um, uh, which, you know, which uh, rightly or wrongly. Um, but we have a, you know, a question about kind of feedback um, from, from Ian as well, kind of a, about have you received any negative feedback from students regarding not providing PowerPoint slides? Some students you know, place mm -hmm. a high value on them for kind of learning and revision. So has that yeah. been an issue or have you kind of received positive feedback? So what I tend to do, because I use Panopto, my current institution, so I do have the ability to add in PowerPoint slides as well, but I can minimize them. So I do add PowerPoint slides as well, but majority of the time, if I'm doing uploading video, the focus is on me and maybe on screen graphics. Um, and also I do a lot of online resources. So um, one of the things I do use in my classes, which I actually recommend most people do actually, is Miro boards. So Miro is free if you don't know about it. And it's kind of like really great for using uh, seminar materials. And then I put, republish them as part of the learning materials for students to come back and revise with. Um, I think students quite like the idea that they're revising a material they've created as well. Um, and it creates a bit more of an inter interactive environment anyway. Thank you. Ian, I've just noticed you've put your camera on. Don't know if you want to come back on that at all. <laughs> I can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I, I had my mic on mute as well as my uh, Zoom on mute, which is a yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, yeah, it's really useful to hear because we use Pinocto as well. And I hadn't mm -hmm. thought about minimising the, the, the screens to make myself bigger. I record myself side by side, but yeah. certainly that's something I might experiment with doing because um, the students value the slides, even if... Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure how much they're getting out of it, but they, they value its presence almost more than yeah. sometimes its content. But yeah. And if you're using Panopto, one of the things I do recommend, again, this is something you might find if you start editing videos yourself, is when you're doing actual editing is making the time points of when, if you are doing PowerPoint slides, because you know, when you upload the slides, you can uh, select when they have, uh, they're shown on screen. It just makes your life a lot easier than having to rewatch your own video. You can just go back and do it that way. So that's one thing, a digital piece of uh, recommendation I have there. Thanks, Liam. Um, a question from Susan. Um, you, you, you touched on kind of time uh, in, in, your, in your presentation as well about how long things can take. And uh, um, uh, she makes the, the point that, you know, uh, making kind of YouTube worthy videos might take, you know, take obviously take longer than kind of talking over a PowerPoint. Um, and you kind of touched on that in your presentation as well. Do you find, though, that as, as time goes on, um, you get quicker? I mean, I guess you have to weigh that against the fact that you also, you've also received feedback from students saying that they don't like content being reused. So there's a kind of a tension there between yeah. what's doable for you as a lecturer and presenter versus perhaps what the students might want. So, um, yeah, do you have any kind of comments on kind of timing? Do things get easier? And how do you balance that with what kind of students are, are saying? Yeah, totally. So it does get a lot easier. So I've when you've got the script, you can reuse the script, you know, uh, you don't and just the recording aspect. And if you are um, if you keep the editing files as well, the, it, at the editing process, you can just slot in a new video, um, which you can use to ultimately really cut down the amount of time. Um, but again, I mean, this is um, one of the questions we probably have to ask ourselves. Online content needs to be good. And while it is, you can just, you know, throw over a PowerPoint slide with you talking over it, and that can be done quite quickly. Um, you know, is this ultimately what students want or is it useful for them? Is it just going to be uh, something that just goes, you upload and it goes into the student's mind in the ether, you know? So creating something which is good, which is memorable, I think, is worthwhile the investment. Um, and maybe we need to have, a again, another discussion with the universities about if they want more online content, we need more time to facilitate it. Um, and I think a lot of departments have had that question um, and discussion amongst themselves. Another question um, from, from Susan, um, again, maybe this could be too early, but it, there might be some kind of work done kind of pre-COVID, who knows? Um, do you know of any kind of um, research or kind of comparative studies of kind of, just kind of, I guess what you'd call the standard kind of power of talking of a PowerPoint approach versus the more kind of um, entertaining kind of YouTube content? Is there anything, any kind of studies or any research you're aware of, or perhaps, you know, in relation to your own your own kind of teaching um, about the impact that potentially has on retention? You, you indicate it has a, potentially has a positive impact on student feedback, um, mm. but does it go further than that in retention, but also perhaps attainment, et cetera? Yeah, I don't have any stats on, or any kind of thoughts on retention. Oh, it's a good and interesting question. 
Um, but what there is, there's a, um, a paper that's been released fairly easily by Begiviva, and it's titled um, Edutainment and Information in Distance Learning and Teaching English to University Students and Adult Learners, um, which is in, this, in a journal called the Journal of Teaching English for Pacific Academic Purposes. I've got a full list of bibliography um, from what I use, by the way, to make this paper. So if you want that, I'll send it over to you afterwards. Um, and ultimately, they do argue that, you know, this is a kind of the more edutainment style, the more YouTuber style of creating video content does work for distance learners. Um, not sure about comparisons in terms of um, specific looking at it from the COVID perspective. Um, although we're in a kind of, again, this is cliche, we're in unprecedented times. Um, I saw some of you laugh and groan then, don't worry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we I think we need it to stabilize a bit and get teaching back to normal and for those of us who do do online learning and then we can evaluate it really because I don't think it's a fair assessment but it's an interesting question and I'd probably count for that more often one more time for one more question this one actually is one that I posted in the chat box um you say that it's just kind of showing your face as a lecturer is important um mm. does that apply to students or kind of other participants um obviously most of us turned our cameras off doing the presentation and turned mm. some of us turned them back on at the end for the for the q a bit um but what do your students do do they keep their cameras on um when it's kind of obviously a live session um uh, do they kind of turn them off etc um have you kind of seen any kind of feedback on that yeah so when it comes to live sessions so when i'm doing when i mean live sessions it usually means like seminars where so i keep all kind of this presenter i do the videos first and i engage with the live sessions after um and in terms of the actual live session aspect you know i do ask you to keep their mic webcams on if possible obviously i know not every student can do that because you know when students can see each other's faces they talk to each other more um and i think everyone who's done online webinars has also found a similar experience um i think that's many when i've discussed this with other people it's like webcams are really important um but i've also found again i talk about miro boards students being able to see each other actually doing things and writing things down that isn't in a text box has been really useful as well um but yeah and i've not really done live sessions where i've um or streamed the videos with in front of a live audience but maybe that's something to try out in the future it might be interesting to stream these videos rather than um, just put them online and just get, try and get some live feedback from students i think that'd be really interesting um and something i'll want to try in the future that's something maybe we can think about at the at PSA Teaching and Learning Network as well, because we obviously be running all these webinars. Um, uh, we know that some people watch attend in person, some watch them afterwards. Um, you know, so it's interesting to kind of to think about the kind of things that we can do um, for future um, future series and future lectures as well. Um, but we've got kind of one minute to go, so I don't think we have time for any further questions. But if you have a question which hasn't been answered, please post it on Twitter, copying in our Twitter account, and I'm sure that um, Liam uh, can can answer it on line or we can pass it on to him to, to answer um, but thank you for coming and thank you to Liam for such a great session um, it has been recorded and it will appear on the website and we're going to do some promo so you'll see it on our Twitter account as well um, we have one more um, session to come for this series uh, on Monday the 5th of July 4 to 5 by Sarah Liu from the University of Edinburgh on academic freedom in a virtual classroom, learning and teaching controversial topics. And that one's not going to be recorded, so if you are interested, um, please do and try and make it um, at the time, 4 o'clock, um, and you can see it on, on our Twitter account and sign up for it from it there. So again, thank you very much for coming. If you're not already a PSA member, um, but you're interested in finding out about becoming a member, and I'm member benefits please go to our website um, and we hope to see you at the next session thank you see you guys thank you for listening thanks liam good to see you <laughs> good to see you too